Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Hey everyone, welcome back. So, it is time. It is happening. The doors to Grit and Grace are finally open, and I am so excited. So uh, in case you missed it, (laughs) I've been talking about it a lot. Um, After one of the busiest years in my business that I just couldn't quite keep up with and keep a sane head (laughs) about me, um, I decided that I really needed to rearrange my business model so that I can work with more women, but not stress my time and energy with more and more private coaching. So after much consideration and in-depth analysis with my amazing business manager, Emily, um, we decided to create a group coaching program that will help women to heal in community with one another. So whether you're getting divorced, trying to decide whether to stay or go, or on the other side, Grit and Grace will give you the tools to build confidence, clarity, and purpose. And it'll also give you direct coaching tools to help you move through whatever roadblocks you hit up against as you move through this incredible transition and upheaval in your life. Um, And it will all be done in an intimate community of women supporting you, cheering you on, holding you when you cry, being your biggest champions, and the whole thing is led by me. We are going to have weekly calls that are up to two hours long because I want to be able to hold everybody in this space. Um, You get a 90-minute intake session with me directly so that I know specifically what your issues are and what you're dealing with. After our initial intake session, I will give you a personalized Uh, program map, which is your roadmap to your healing through the program, uh, and so much more. I have every month I'm bringing on a special guest to give a workshop that is outside of the uh, weekly calls. That's sort of in addition. And our first guest is Britt Frank, who was on the podcast a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about trauma and healing and the science of being stuck. Um, In October, I have my dear friend, Robert Behedry. He is a breathwork facilitator, and he's going to do an incredible somatic healing group session with everybody. I'm really excited about it. I already have a group of women who have signed up and it's just, I can't tell you how excited I am for this group that's coming together because I think it's going to be just magical. If you are ready to create profound shifts in your ability to own your worth and your strength and your power, then grit and grace is exactly for you. So Um, head on over to kateanthony.com slash coaching and you can read more about it and sign up for a consultation and then you and I will talk about whether grit and grace is right for you. That's kateanthony.com slash coaching and the link is also in the show notes. So moving on to today's show, I have with me today Monica Maze. Monica is a certified family law specialist with over 20 years of experience. She represents high net worth clients in Los Angeles and Silicon Valley. Monica has been named a California super lawyer since 2015 and has been recognized in the International Chamber's High Net Worth 2017 to 2019 Guide for Matrimonial Law. 
She is passionate about what she does, and she has made it her mission to educate others about everything family law, including, and this is what we're talking about today, why she thinks everyone should have a prenup. Now, before you think that this is not for you because Monica specializes in high net worth, this conversation is actually about why literally everyone should have a prenup, whether you are high net worth or not. And in this episode, Monica tells a great story about someone who had absolutely nothing, no money, no property, no nothing. She just had a germ of an idea. She created a prenup and it looks like it was for a good a good reason. So anyway, the family law and sort of matrimonial law is changing and shifting. Um, and Monica thinks that within the next decade, everyone will have a prenup. So if you're ever thinking about you might get married again, this episode is a, a must listen. So without further ado, here's my conversation with Monica Maze. Monica Mazze, thank you so much for coming on to the podcast to talk about all things, all things agreements, all agreements <laughs> that we should have in our relationships. Yeah, no, thank you for having me. Um, I love talking about this. It's one of my favorite topics to talk about in family law. You, when you first wrote to me, you said something about like the family law system is broken or something. Is <laughs> something like that? And those say more about that. What do you What do you see? What do you think is broken? The family law that we have in this country is very outdated. You know, these are laws. You know, for the most part, that have existed since. Um, you know the 1970s, and they really haven't been updated to keep up with the times. And one area that I feel very strongly about um, are premarital agreements. Um, I personally think that everyone should have one and that that's kind of where the future of marriage is moving. Mm. So right now, you know, you go to city hall, um, you get a marriage license, no one hands you a pamphlet um, or a link to a website that tells you what you're signing up for. It's almost like signing a contract that you've never seen mm. and you don't know the terms. And when you think about it in every other aspect of your life, you would never do that. But we do that when we get married. And then if it doesn't work out and you're, and people are divorcing, they come to me and they say, well, I didn't know that's what I signed up for. And I said, I know no one tells you. I think it's really important that people one, understand, and two, know that you actually don't have to just accept the default. You can make your own agreement. It's so interesting, right? Because we, you know, we all talk about how divorce laws vary state to state, which essentially means that marital law varies state to state, right? If you are, if if everything is community property, when you're dividing your assets, you should know that when you're getting married, you're actually commingling all of your assets, right? Like the so if divorce laws are different state to state, so are marriage laws. And you should know what those are when you get married. Yes. It seems like common sense. It kind of does, doesn't right? it? And it's shocking that people do it every day in every state across the country, and no one typically has any idea what they're signing up for. It's amazing to me. I, I think it's, um, it's, I can't believe that there hasn't been like an outcry about this <laughs> sooner. Oh, that's so funny. Now you're just like, you're saying it that way. And it's like, oh my God, <laughs> this is terrible. You know, I mean, I don't, I feel like people get in, go, they get married they, I mean, I think people get married without actually knowing each other, you know, so let's like, never mind, like knowing the laws, you know, it's like, but there are things that we should be teaching people before they get married, like premarital counseling, I think should be mandatory and not just one session with your priest, right? Like months, this is a very intense, you, you are joining your life and that should include the laws in your state and what you're really signing up for. I think you're absolutely right. Yeah. And so, another, another advantage of a premarital agreement is as part of the process in any state that you live in, in order to have a valid agreement, you have to um, 
you have to exchange, you know, financial information. You basically have to tell each other what you have, what assets you have and what liabilities you have. And I mean, for me, that I, I, what a helpful exercise, because if you weren't going through the premarital agreement process, I mean, who would do that? You don't go on a date and say, you know, let's exchange balance sheets and no one has that conversation. So I, I think, you know, one good thing that comes out of doing these agreements is there's a lot more transparency going into the marriage than you would usually otherwise have. It forces you to have a conversation. Yes. About finances or, oh, I didn't know that you still had $100,000 of student loan debt, or I didn't know you had, you know, credit card debt. Is that something that you expect, you know, that we're paying off? Are you paying off? Um, you know, I think it's such a helpful exercise because yeah. again, when it's city hall is going to, is going to have you do that. Right. And it's one of those things that people don't, you know, it's like, oh, but this is like, that's gross. That's gross stuff. Like we're, we're in the like, honey, we're, you know, we're happy, we're excited and don't like, you know, don't yuck our yum with all that stuff. But actually I think it, it leads to greater intimacy when you have these conversations. Yes. You know, we don't have any statistics yet, although I think that we will because <sighs> Premarital agreements really have just become um, more popular in the last 10 years, I would say. So we don't have statistics yet, but I would be interested to see if there's a correlation between the divorce rate and people that have prenups for first time marriages. Um, I think it's really would be interesting to know because uh, having to go through the process and share information and have a hard conversation seems to me like a pretty good start for a healthier marriage. Absolutely. I I totally agree. And so, okay, so what goes into a prenup, right? That you're, these are not just for rich people. This is something that you believe everybody, regardless of financial circumstance, because historically we think of prenups as like, I'm a billionaire and I'm going to protect my assets if we get divorced. But that's not what they are anymore. No. You know, so you you can't address kid stuff. You can't predetermine custody or child support. But other than that, you can agree to anything that you want. It's pretty amazing. You could agree that what you earn during marriage is going to be uh, joint. You could agree that what you earn is going to be yours, what I earn is going to be mine, or, and it doesn't even have to be black or white. You could say, you know, 60% of what I earn, I'll put in the pot. And that'll be a community. But, you know, 40% is going to be my separate. And I want to keep that kind of for myself. Um, you know, what if I start a business during marriage? You know, do I want that to be community? Or do we feel like, you know, that should be the creator spouse's separate property? And so whatever is agreed to in the in the prenup overrides like general state law. Yes. It's your roadmap as to what would happen, you know, if there is a divorce. Right. So you also don't, you know, have to pay people like me a bunch of money. It's it really should be a clear roadmap of what's what's going to happen. I mean, hopefully you put it in a drawer and you never have to look at it. But if you do, both people know what to expect. There's yeah. some certainty going into the situation. And it's a lot less complicated to financially untangle because you've already predetermined what's going to happen. And it's something that people end up revisiting throughout their marriage, right? Because again, it feels to me like we can, you know, pre think that we're predetermining as much as we can. But then once we get into it, we might be like, actually, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Actually, I think we need more than 60% of my earnings to live on. So do you see people revising them as they get into their relationships or as they have kids? Well, you certainly can. You know, you can have an amendment to the premarital agreement. It has to be in writing and signed and notarized. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the better practice would, would to have, have an agreement that you don't have to update that has some built-in provisions. You know, for example, I have a lot of clients who, you know, they'll agree to one thing, but if there's children, as soon as children are born, then, then it's kind of alternative B picks up. That That's the better agreement. It would yeah. be better to not have a lot of iterations and drafts floating around, but you certainly can. I see. And sometimes there's just a life circumstance you didn't anticipate um, and you're going to want to amend your agreement to provide for something else. 
But, uh, you know, along the lines of, um, you know, these, a lot of people think these are just for rich and famous people or just, you know, Kim and Kanye. I had a client about 15 years ago that came to me and she was 30 years old and she didn't have anything, but she had an idea for a company. Uh, mm -hmm. Very adamant that she wanted this company to be her separate property. And she told me the idea for the company and she had kind of gotten started. And I thought, eh, I don't, I don't see how that's ever going to work. I don't think people are really going to buy that, but you know, in my inside voice <laughs> um, and we, we did the prenup. Did, she didn't own a home. She didn't have a 401k. She just had this idea. And about five years later, I'm in the airport and there she is on the cover of Forbes. And now it's a billion dollar business, which shows you that I am like the worst judge. <laughs> that you have no idea what you're talking about, right? None. So don't ever ask me for investment advice. <laughs> but look, she had nothing, but she had the idea and she knew that she wanted it to be her own. And look, it could have been a bust and, and, and worth nothing. And so she, yeah. she, maybe she spent a, a thousand dollars, you know, on this agreement, but but look what happened. It ended up being a billion dollar business. It's still in business today. Um, so it just goes to show you, you don't need to really have anything. And these right. agreements could be, you know, a game changer. Right, right. So what are some other things that people put in these agreements? They don't have to, but they can also address what would happen if someone uh, passes away during the marriage. So this oh. is happily married, you know, not a divorce situation. And one per, one spouse predeceases the other, and you can have a promise in the premarital agreement about what your estate plans are going to say. Mm. The important thing about that is that if someone doesn't get around to creating their estate plan or changing it, and there's you know an accident or something, the probate court will take into consideration what was in the prenup. So, but that's just another area, not divorce related, um, but also something important to talk about before you get married or what the expectation is. Some people say, you know, I really can't leave you all of my estate because I have a, a brother and sister who, you know, I'd like to leave something to should I pass away. So that's important to know, like, I, you know, I'd like to, to leave them something. That's important to know, you know, before you kind of go into that situation, what the um, expectations are of each other. And so what happens if during divorce, if somebody you know, tries to fight this and, and like, you know, maybe have some basis, you know, for, I mean, what would, what would the basis be, I suppose, for fighting what was agreed to? Um, usually it's that um, someone was pressured or unduly influenced to sign the agreement. Mm. They didn't understand what they were signing. Okay. Or um, in California, at least, if the agreement was enforced, it would be inherently unfair. Ah, okay. Interesting. Yeah, because you see prenups being sort of like, is there a, I remember hearing maybe that there was like a time frame, like it can't be like in the 24 hours prior to the wedding where someone like the mother-in-law is suddenly coming in and shoving something under your nose, right? These are things that should be discussed and and planned far before the wedding. Yes, every state has a different rule about when these have to be signed. Mm. Uh, for example, in California, um, once the agreement is in a final draft, no one can sign it for seven days. Now you could sign it on the, the morning of the wedding. I mean, not ideal and we don't like to do that because that's stressful, but- um, it's, also, it's a little gross, right? Yeah, it's a so we, we try not you know to do that, but as long as you waited the seven days from the time that there's been a final draft, and I think it, the thinking is, um, okay, this is the final draft. We're not going to make any more changes to it. And then everyone has seven days to really think about it before they sign it. Is this, are you, you know, are they sure they don't want to make any more changes? Um, so California kind of built in this, this period, this reflection period to make sure everyone is being thoughtful before they actually sign it. Huh. Interesting. Interesting. And then what about some other states? Do they, what are some other, do you know what other state laws? Yeah. A, a lot of states, like you were talking about, tie it to, um, you know, the wedding date. So it can't be signed, you know, so many days right up, you know, before the wedding ceremony. Mm -hmm. And so it's important to know what the requirement is and the state that you live in. 
Um, because if you're going to go through the trouble of, of putting one of these things together, you want it to be enforceable. So you want to make sure you're following, you know, all the requirements. Some states need notarized signatures. Some states don't. Some states you need a witness to sign the agreement in addition to the two people getting married. Some states don't. Some states you both need attorneys. Some states you don't. So uh, the requirements are very different. Again, this should be in a pamphlet as soon as you get engaged in your state, it should be sent to you so that you know, right? Because you're like, oh, wait, I want to have a prenup. And then like you do it wrong in your state, (laughs) you know, you want to know what that is. Yes. I I think we're moving towards there. I think it's going to be probably another decade before we're there. And so right now it's just, yeah, you have to do your own homework and figure, kind of figure it out yourself or or call an attorney in your area, you know, there's, um, you know, there's a lot of um, very, you know, affordable family law attorneys that do these Mm -hmm. agreements. Um, You know, they don't have to be terribly expensive. Right. If you think about it, I mean, you, you know, whatever you're spending on the agreement could save you a lot of money down the road if, if there's a divorce and you're not having, you know, to go to court and, you know, pay a lot of money in attorney's fees. Yeah. It's It's almost like insurance. Yeah, right. It's it's worth spending the money up front so you don't necessarily have to pay it on the back end where it's going to be a hell of a lot more expensive. Yes. Okay, so how do you approach your partner like you're in this like love bubble, you're you just got engaged, everything is so like happy. How do you have this really difficult conversation? Everyone asks me that. I think um Sometimes people can blame it on their families. <laughs> <laughs> my um, mom says I have to do this. <laughs> yeah, you know, my parents brought this up to me, you know, because I, I might have an inheritance and they brought it up. And so I thought, you know, we should talk about it. Um, or my estate planning attorneys, you know, brought it up. It's sometimes it's easier kind of pass the buck. <laughs> yeah, pass the buck, put it on someone else that they raised it. You know, if that's not the situation, I just think saying, you know, hey, we read about these agreements all the time, you know, do you think that's something that, you know, you know, we would want to do? And what I'm finding, especially with the younger generations, um, is there's not such a taboo uh, around the subject, I think, because they just grew up, you know, reading about it, um, the celebrity prenups, more and more couples. Now we have two working spouses. And so both people kind of have some skin in the game or something might be financially important, you know, to each of them. I think starting a business is a really interesting topic because nowadays, you know, it could very easily be both people. And um, there's, you know, some people feel very strongly, you know, if I started the business, it's my baby. That's right. And I want it to be my separate. And if you start your own, it should be your. Right. You know, some people don't feel that way, but I have to tell you, um, I'm seeing more and more the majority of people having that mindset, especially around starting businesses. Absolutely. I mean, I could see sort of saying, okay, like, you know, while we're in the marriage, obviously you benefit from whatever, you know, income or success there is in this business. But if we split, it's mine. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Yeah, That makes a lot of sense. And, And nowadays it's, you know, people are starting businesses all the time. Um, COVID, you know, gave rise to that, that happening more and more. So look, that's a topic where both people might say, yeah, we, we, we both want a prenup for that reason. And now a word from our sponsor. Back to school season is coming up, which can be difficult for those going through a divorce. This is especially true when alcohol and child safety is a concern. So as you know, on the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, my mission includes helping people keep their children as safe as possible while in an often high conflict divorce. So that is why I've partnered with Soberlink to help offer resources to help you navigate the upcoming back to school season. Soberlink is a remote alcohol monitoring technology created to help prove sobriety in custody cases. The system includes a high-tech breathalyzer device with facial recognition that allows you to receive real-time updates from monitored co-parents anytime, anywhere, allowing for swift intervention for improved child safety. Soberlink has helped 
hundreds of thousands of people document proof of sobriety in real time for peace of mind in child custody cases. Soberlink is currently offering free back to school and divorce packets that include a Q and A with top with a top divorce attorney. I think I happen to know that this is our friend Susan Guthrie. It also has a back to school checklist, uh, communication tips, and more. So go to Soberlink dot com slash DSG to request your free packet today. That's soberlink.com slash DSG. And now back to our show. It feels like it's becoming certainly with the, as you said, the younger generations, it's less of a gross, sticky conversation. These kids these days are happy. <laughs> They're approaching marriage really differently. It means, and many of them are not even approaching marriage at all. They're just like, that's an old, fa- old, fa- old fashioned institution that we don't want any part of. So, and good for them. But there are other things that they should be, that they also need to protect, right? I mean, if you're, even if you're not getting married, things like cohabitation agreements, right? How do you, what, what goes in those? Um, So a cohabitation agreement is for a couple that's not married, but they're living together. Mm -hmm. Um, And if the relationship doesn't work out and you break up, you have to decide, are we just walking away from the relationship? No one owes anyone anything. Or if we break up, is one person, you know, going to do something financially for the other person? Um, In California, if you're living together, Um, It could give rise to something almost like spousal support or alimony. Um, It's not very common, but it could. And so, um, you know, I do have a lot of clients that actually never intend to get married. Like you said, they have no interest in, you know, being, you know, taking part in that. So they're going to live together, you know, as a couple. Um, But that could be, you know, it could be five years, it could be 25 years, and they want to make clear what the um, obligations and responsibilities would be if there's a breakup of the relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And those are becoming more and more popular. I would say um, I have a lot of clients um, who are already divorced and now they're in a new relationship, probably are not going to get married again, not important anymore. You know, they're not going to have any more kids. Yeah. Uh, so they're having these cohabitation and putting together these cohabitation agreements. Yeah. And I think once you've been through a divorce and you know, like all the pitfalls and everything that that could come up, like you're probably more inclined to get these things on paper early. I know yeah. I would be. <laughs> they don't want to, they don't want to repeat, you know, of, of kind of what they went through. So. Right. Right. Exactly. There's another agreement that I think is really, really important and possibly maybe a little stickier. Um, and that's a nesting agreement. Can we talk, can you talk about, have you done those? Like, is that a legal thing or is that just like, okay, here we go. We're just going to agree to these things. Do, do people go to lawyers for that? Yes, it's usually part of a bigger agreement, you know, Uh so so nesting has to do with the children um, and some families decide that the children are going to stay in the family residence and the parents are going to rotate in and out. And usually the agree that agreement to what we call nest as part of a larger settlement agreement that dealt with the legal custody of the kids and, you know, all the financial parts of the whole divorce. Um, a judge can't order parents to nest, so it has to be something that both of the parents agree to. It would be terrible if it was court ordered. Oh my god! It would be very terrible. So everyone's got to be on board with it. In my opinion, it's a short-term solution, but it's not a long-term. I so agree with that, and I want to hammer that point home because people in my Facebook group bring it up all the time, and I always say the same. I always say that I'm always like, "This is a, this is a really good short term solution, but it does not have long term legs." I mean, how are you going to create a new life? How are you going to start dating? How are you when you're you know? Because often what happens is they just have one extra, one extra house, right? Because you can't like, who's going to have three places, right? So you've got one, maybe studio apartment, and you're rotating in and out of this, of the same two homes. So you're sharing two homes now with this person, (laughs) just not at the same time. You're not going to do that long-term. No, I don't think it's realistic. You know, people are going to move on. They're going to have significant others. I think it gets really messy. 
you know, I, I think the, the clients that come to me saying, you know, oh, this is what we want to do permanently. I mean, it's a it's such a nice, warm and fuzzy idea. And so I applaud the, the thought behind it. But I always say, you know, six months a year. And then I think everyone needs it just it can actually create more issues later. Sure. And, and it become more complicated than it needs to be. But great short term solution while you're figuring out housing you know, if you can, what people can afford, what their settlement's going to look like, right? It's a great short-term solution. Yeah. And it's a great way to get the kids sort of transitioned, you know, it's sort of a long transition period for the kids, which is, you know, for some children is really useful. I think the Um, younger children really benefit because they, um, now they get used to spending time with each parent, but separately. mm -hmm. They don't have to go anywhere. And so, you know, I think, I think that's nice, but but yeah, I think longer than a year, probably a disaster. <laughs> so, what, so what do people put in their nesting agreements? What are what are some of the points that people should have in there? Well, definitely a schedule and making clear that when it's their time with the kids and the family residents, if, if, if the agreement is the other parents not to be there, then making that really clear. You know, some some people don't have that. They have that during their time in the family residence with the kids, the other parent could be there at dinners or one dinner a week. So, I mean, everyone has their own agreement, but also having boundaries, you know, um, you know, is someone going to have a locked closet where they can keep, you know, their, their personal things? Um, are they sleeping in the same bed or bedroom? I mean, you know, so I think yeah. being clear about that heads off a lot of arguments later. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I always say like, put things in, like the dishes have to be done at the transition day. The sheets need to be washed and, and clean for the transition, right? Like garbage is taken out, like, you right. know, vacate. A huge vacate. mess for the other person to clean. Yeah. Yeah. Vacate the space in a, as you know, as if you're, you know, leaving your parents' house or something, whatever, right. If you're staying at, like, you're staying at a friend's house and, and, Right. Like you're a guest at someone's house and you're, right. you know, yeah. So yeah. It's, it's important to have boundaries and, you know, and think and think through that. And it, it could be a great band aid for a while. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But then it, start, it really starts to get messy when like I had a client whose spouse ordered red satin sheets that arrived at one of their nesting locations, <laughs> you know, and my client was like, well, <laughs> so I guess we're having guests at this location that we did not agree to. Right. And so, you know, you've got to put those things in writing and that need to be signed, I think, you know, so that they are actually legally binding so that like, if someone's getting red satin sheets delivered to one of the locations, you can say like, this is a, you know, I mean, sure. They're just having red satin sheets delivered, but Think what, it's not, really a not good for themselves, right? It's not a stretch to think what they're for. Yeah, I, th- I think yeah. Who who could come over? Who you know, you know, our our partners or significant others coming? Are they not? Can they come but not spend the night? I mean, you know, there's so many kind of details that have to be worked through. I think to have a an effective agreement that doesn't create more problems, right? Because even if you know, if you come home and then there's like two wine glasses in the dish drain, you know, like you're just you're leaving yourself open for pain, for conflict. Yeah. And are, are you emotionally ready for that? Because every, everyone's going to move on, right? And, and people are free to move on even before the divorce is, is, is final kind of, you know, nowadays. And sometimes, you know, someone doesn't kind of want to see or, or, or know that it's too hurtful. So they're not in a place emotionally um, where that might be a good idea. Are there any other agreements or things that people that you feel that people should be thinking about either before marriage or during divorce? I mean, obviously they should be thinking about a lot of things <laughs> <But> <laughs> from a legal perspective. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think of all the agreements that there are, I, you know, which are cohabitation agreements, premarital agreements, you know, and then settlement agreements. If you, if you find yourself, you know, in a divorce, and then there's custody agreements for for people that uh, were not married but had kids together. You know, I think the most important agreement is a premarital agreement. To be honest, I think that is the most impactful agreement that you can you can have and that the law offers right now. 
um, where you get to really choose your own rules and your own destiny as a couple if it doesn't work out. I mean, it's very powerful. And I don't think people really grasp or understand that that they, you know, that they have this ability. I mean, I think it's huge. Um, we can opt out of the default and create your own, completely your own, uh, absent the kid stuff, you're on your own to agree to whatever you want. I mean, I have seen all kinds of agreements from, I mean, you don't want them to be too complicated, but I've had clients that they're both engineers and there's these formulas that they came up with that they want applied. And I wouldn't suggest making it overly complicated, but every couple has things that are uniquely important to them that the default law doesn't address. And this gives you an opportunity as a couple to address that thing, whether it's a new business, whether it's um, buying a house and how title to that house is, is going to be taken. Um, or is someone going to get reimbursed if they use separate money, you know, to buy that house? I mean, they, every, I, every couple has kind of I, these trigger issues mm-hmm. uh, that you can actually address beforehand and they don't need to create one conflict during the marriage because you've already talked about it. And then two, if it doesn't work out, there's already a clear path as to how that's going to be resolved. I call premarital agreements, conscious coupling, you know, um, there's um, someone out there that coined the phrase conscious uncoupling. And then kind of Gwyneth Paltrow took that and made that um, popular in being mindful about how you divorce. But I think it starts before then, um, you know, so before you get married and being conscious about how you're moving into the relationship financially. Absolutely. Before we go, I just, are there any sort of like wacky things? Like what are some of like some examples of some sort of outlandish things that you've seen in these agreements? Like how far does it go? (laughs) So so many people ask me if there can be an adultery provision. So if someone cheats on me, I get more money or I pay them less. Uh Um, Those provisions are not enforceable. I I know they're not enforceable in California and likely probably not in, in most states except for the very few states that still have fault divorce. But that's what I get asked about uh, the most. I did have a celebrity couple, and this was uh, about 20 years ago, and they're still married. So um, I represented the uh, soon-to-be husband, and he wanted a wait clause in the premarital agreement, which I found, one, offensive, and two, were it would oh. never be enforceable. It's against public policy. Oh my God. Oh my God. Which is, oh, oh my God. But the funny thing, they're still married and it's been 20 years. So I, I, I didn't think that was starting off as a good sign, but apparently. <laughs> wow. Uh, yes. I so badly want to know who this is. And <laughs> tell me, I need to know who I need to hate. <laughs> Yes, it was very offensive. I was, you know, very offensive. Wow. So when you say it's not enforceable, because like, you know, we started off saying like, you put whatever you want in it. But like, there are things that are not enforceable. Like if you cheat, I get more money. What's enforceable, not enforceable? Like, how do you, I mean, obviously your attorney is, this is why you hire an attorney to do this with you. Yes. In general, it can't be something that they say would violate public policy. And I, I mean, that's kind of hard to know. That's a big umbrella. Things like the weight clause, uh, the cheating. How does cheating, how does that violate public policy? Well, it does if you're if you're in a no-fault state, right? So like California is a no-fault state. If someone um, cheats, it has absolutely no relevance to the divorce. They don't get punished. There's no monetary uh, repercussion. You know, it doesn't really come into play mm-hmm. uh, at, at all. Even if you put it in your premarital agreement. Yes. You can gain weight. Yes. And, and you, and it, you probably will. And you so, probably will because that's what happens when you get older. Yes. You get and older. So especially for women, when we hit menopause, yes. I hope he has gained a lot of weight. <laughs> I know I could not, I could not believe it. I just thought, gosh, this is so superficial. This can't be a great sign. Oh but they, they've made it a long time. So Maybe, maybe us shooting down his idea of knock some sense into him. I don't know. Wow. I can't get over that. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to get over it, but I cannot get over it. <laughs> okay. So those are some things that people ask that are not enforceable. Are there any that are like, you know, totally random that you've had that are, that are enforceable that are like interesting anecdotes? Pets are treated not like children, but uh, as a possession, like a thing. So you yeah. certainly can 
talk about your pet in your premarital agreement. Who's going to get the pet? Are you sharing the pet? You, you know, and I, I had a couple who, um, they, they didn't have any children. They, they knew that they weren't going to have children and they had two Siamese cats. And we had this very elaborate agreement. If the marriage ended, the cats were going to go back and forth. And there was going to be, you know, if one goes on vacation that, you know, they were, these cats were like their children. And so, but because they're pets and not children, we are able to, to talk about them. Uh, pets are actually a, a big deal. You know, they're very important to people or they're coming into the relationship with a pet and they want to make sure. Yeah. I, ew. please don't make your pet go back and forth guys. <laughs> not cats, not cats. Cats don't like it. Cats yeah, don't I like just it. feel like it's not, it's well, if at that point, it's not about the, it's not about the animal. It's about you. About that, right? mm-hmm. Ugh, anyway. Oh my gosh, Monica, this is so, this has been so interesting. I so appreciate your uh, expertise and insight into this and your belief that everyone should have a premarital agreement. And I got to say for most of my listeners who are getting divorced, you know, or contemplating divorce, I think a lot of you would have a very, um, they'd have an easier time if they had this. And so I hope that it really helps people um, think about this for the future, for going forward. Yeah, I hope so. Well, thank you for having me. This was so much fun. Yeah. So where, where so you practice out of San Francisco, yes. And w- so where can people find you? Sure. So you can um, you could find me. My law firm is Seidman and Bancroft, or you could just Google my name, Monica Mazze, and I will come up. Um, I handle cases all over California, but mainly San Francisco, Silicon Valley, and Los Angeles, anywhere here. And I'm I'm also happy to give people referrals for attorneys in other states. I do a lot of work in um, other states and also internationally. So I can't practice, but I have a lot of connections uh, internationally as well. So I'm I'm happy to give referrals or try to you know set people up with a good match if they need help with that. That's great. I, you know, people ask me all the time and I'm just like, I don't know, <laughs> you know, I, one of these days I'm going to compile a list. Maybe I'll, I'll, uh, I'll hit you up <laughs> so that we can sure. sort of co-compile because yeah, we need them everywhere. Awesome. And all of Monica's information obviously will be in the show notes. So thank you so much, Monica. I so appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at the Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.